And there we go, everyone. We are back again for another fantastic conversation on Friday Night Counterattack. We're here, we're rocking, we're rolling. And it's a bit of an impromptu podcast because we have to talk about some of the, the craziest conversations we've had in the summer transfer market. And we've had a few fantastic guests on recently regarding the summer transfers and big things that have happened. And we've got our biggest one yet, which is great to see. James, why don't you introduce yourself? I get, yeah, I'm James. Hamza's social media editor, I suppose. Um, here to talk about the transfers in the not so an exciting transfer window so far, but starting to come along. You know, some bits and bobs are starting to happen. James is the MVP of Friday Night Counterattack. That's all I'm saying. Nothing happens without him. He is the one. In the I work for. He's the one that I work for, basically, which is a, which is the main <laughs> thing, which is good. But now nah, there's something some being some great Premier League transfers that we've got to talk about today. And we're going to be learning more about them as well and seeing how they fit into their systems, how they fit with their new managers. And realistically speaking, though, it's going to be very, very difficult because there have been some big sales from leaving the Premier League. And we've got some big players yeah. to come into the Premier League as well. But um, I've got three to talk about and James has got three to talk about as well. So, James, fire away. I know there's a player on your mind, a centre-back on your mind that you want to talk about with how well he will do in the Premier League. So let's hear it, my friend. I think, yeah, I start with Calafiori. He, I think... Have you ever had your hair like him as well? I wish. I was. I tried growing my hair out, but I couldn't, I can't ever get past that like mid-length where it just looks awful. I could never that's grow not, out that's with longer his than hair. Me. That's longer his than me. I have like Keanu like... Reeves in like John Wick and that's kind of it. I'm like, oh, it's just bushy. It's not yeah. great. But California, that like put it out there. He's a handsome man. That is a that is a handsome man. But also, like if they're going to use him in this left back hybrid, it's obviously at uh, Bologna he would step out of defence. And I think Arsenal have been looking for an improvement on Zinchenko for about a year or so now since he basically joined. Yeah, I, I, he's he's a good player, Zinchenko, but he's he's tidy on the ball and stuff. But I always like. I like when we play. We Liverpool played um, Arsenal in a preseason friendly, and I just saw their fans go mad about like whenever we play them. Mo Salah often has quite a good time against Zinchenko if they can isolate him. So I think having a almost like a, a cent. I mean, it's the Arteta Pep way now of having four centre backs across the back line who are all over six foot. But Poppy and Tony Pulis, they could they could never be like Tony Pulis. Fancy to- Tony Pulis with a little bit of a Spanish touch. Yeah. Uh, it, it, to be fair, like he he is going to be an improvement, Calafiore coming in for that left back position into midfield or kind of coming up onto like almost left wing because he could do a bit of the overlap as well, having played because he's not a centre back who's going to be pushed to left back. He has done bits of left back, so I think Arsenal are a signing away. You think of they've got to win the league, like they 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 need they're a signing or two away from getting over the line and getting past Manchester City. And maybe that could be, I think that this left back hybrid, I think he could be that kind of position that helps them in those big games. I think he's a really good signing and he was quite, he was on the cheaper side under 40 million. It's not bad for a top player. Yeah. I reckon they would have charged him more if it, if it was a bigger club as well, like a Real Madrid or a Manchester yeah. United. Have gone for oh, yeah. More of the tax as well. But I kind of agree with the Arsenal one as well, because with Arsenal, you can look at someone like Federico Chiesa, who's available for sale at Juventus for £25, £30 million. Pounds. He would be another quality winger to have ahead of Martinelli, ahead of Saka sometimes. And especially with this longer season, with longer Champions League campaigns yeah. as well, it could work in their favour. Arteta said they have to win every single game to be in with a contention of winning the league this season, which like, is crazy to think about. Wait, you, you, the last what was The last time Man City didn't win the league, I think Liverpool went like the first 27 games, they won 26 of them. And that's almost what you have. You always have to beat Man City into to, into like submission. Yeah. Where you pull such a lead. And I'm not even talking like eight. No, I'm talking like you've got to go 10 plus points and get them to a point where they almost feel they, they can't catch you. Because if you go neck and neck with City come 10 games to go, they just then won't lose a game. So I think Arteta is probably right there. That's he knows great. what he's talking about. Because there was that time when England had an international break and Grealish and Walker went up to Saka. They were like, congratulations on winning the league. And that kind yeah. of got their mentality back in terms of, yeah, we're going to come back and chase Arsenal. And they did. 
and it ended yeah. up being four in a row for Manchester City, which is crazy. But in terms of Calafiori, I don't think he's going to be ahead of Gabriel in the centre back. So it's no. going to have to be a left back position. But I so. remember last season they bought Urian Timber from yeah, Ajax. that's true, and he was a right yeah. back from Ajax. But Arteta wanted him as an inverted left back. So what do you think about that? Timber, Calafiori, big rotation he's... there, and Tommy Asu as well. Yeah, it's interesting because. They really are. They've got so many defenders, like, oh, and especially in like those hybrid, because Timber can play on the right hand side as well. Coming into midfield, you do it on the left. It, I mean, you wouldn't argue against it because it's a lot of options. And I think the biggest worry, I think, like you mentioned, I don't think Calafiori since obviously come in over Gabriel, but I think if I was an Arsenal fan, especially last season, as we saw the year before, they were one injury to get a uh, Saliba from Rob Holding playing there. So yeah. if you lose Saliba and then said all oh, Gabriel and you can bring Calafiori in, that's a lot. That's a lot better than Rob Holding. No disrespect to Rob Holding, but and you had Kiwior as well, who was a decent player, but is nowhere He's... near the quality of what we've seen with Gabriel over previous Exactly. Seasons. So I think just having that, like you said, you need to you you need to be able to win every one of your games and come the, and like then come the end of the season, you need to obviously have that those rotation options and kind of because Arsenal last season, I think. They're like starting eleven played something like the most mint. Like they had a fixed starting eleven for a lot of the season. There wasn't a lot of rotation, which then, as you get late into the season, Champions League games, that takes its toll. So if they can have a little bit more rotation, Timber for, gives Ben White can rotate in with Ben White. Can use kind of Fiori at left back, centre back. It just gives a nice different option, I guess. It's true. There's more variety there and there's more to rely yeah. upon as well, which is great. And Calafiori is fantastic for Bologna last season, getting them into Champions League football for the first time in the 21st century as well. So that's going to be a, a player to be talking about from Arsenal. I think, but my only hesitation would be, I think that was his only see that's his only full season in like a top five European league, Calafiori. Because he was a bit part through... player at Roma as well. Yeah, no, no, no couple of seasons at Basel Arsenal but that's quite a, like one season in a top it, it's it's a ri- it's a calculated risk but you got I'm sure he, he, he's a good player but it's just that it's not a great sample size for how we might do for years but I'm sure it'd be um, Arteta knows how to get the most out of players so definitely now, it's going to be good to see how how that happens with um, Calafiori as well because one player that Arsenal have lost this summer and a lot of their fans are not very happy about it, is Emil Smith-Rowe. Emil Smith-Rowe, yeah. who they gave the number 10, who they believe was going to be just along the same kind of quality as Bukayo Saka. And when you've got someone like Martin Odegaard, the captain leader legend ahead of him in that place, and Gabriel Martinelli, who offers something different on the wing, it was very, very difficult for Emil Smith-Rowe to really get into the starting lineup for Mikel Arteta's team. And he was someone who had to go on loan a few times to Huddersfield, to RB Leipzig as well. And Annoyingly, he had that knee injury um, against Sheffield United in the October 2013. And then he was just out for six weeks and his momentum just ruined it from there as well. But he was someone who's won the under-23s World Cup. He's someone who's won the under-17s World Cup for England. So he's got it in him to become an England international. But let me hear thoughts on Smith Road to Fulham because I think they're going to have to have a, a very well-disciplined side without Paulina in the side as well, um, which would yeah. be very cool. And they've got Andreas oh. Pereira and Iwobi as well in those attacking lineups. I think it's a good signing from. I, I, it's a great signing from Fulham. I think he's a good. It's, it's a shame with Smith Rowe. It's a shame a lot. Like seeing it with a lot of um, academy players moving from their kind of clubs now because of the obviously pure profit you get from their sale. Mm. But he's a good. He's a good player. I think he's probably in that kind of region of. He's probably too good to just be a squad player at Arsenal. Not that he's yeah. too good obviously for Arsenal. I think because he wasn't getting enough game time. But he's probably too good a player to just sit there and play 10, 15 games a season. Whereas you move to someone oh, Palmer like part two, I think. Yeah, yeah. Like Palmer, if he just stayed at City last year, he'd have played, but not anywhere near like he did for Chelsea. He may so not I have think got into the England side as well. He probably I'd be surprised if he had got into the England side. Mm. So I think for Smith Rowe, go to Fulham, get that game time. There are some like Pereira, I you said Andres Pereira, good player, good player, always he's done quite well for Fulham. But I think Smith Rowe might be that. And he's a bit younger. He's got a touch. He might be a touch better. And I, no, I really rate Smith Rowe. It's a shame with the injuries because he was like, but him and he was part of that kind of like when they, when they first became like when Arteta first got them clicking, 
when they were not when they started challenging for like Manchester City, but when they were like starting to challenge for Europe again, he was part of, a big part of that. Like you said, he got them in attention. So they clearly had him in mind as like a long term player. But I think just injuries. Boy, in yeah, and they had a great chat that like Saka and Emerson bro. Like rocking all over. It's a great chat. Like that is an unbelievable. And he scored chart. that goal against Spurs as well, which was crazy. Yeah, oh, that was a great game. But yeah, I think great move. And also, like, you see it a lot with like, like guys when they come through London academies, they like to stay in London. So I yep. think for him, the, and like Fulham's quite a nice area, I believe. Not particularly been there, but as far as I'm aware, it's quite a affluent area. So yeah, I think all round. And um, what's his name? Fulham manager. Why can't I think of it? Marcus. Can't think of his name. That's yes, Marcus Silva, good manager. I think he'll get their play some good football. As long as that like you said, you big I think replacing Polina yeah. is a big importance because he's just a tackle machine, just ball winner. And if you kind of want a player like Smith Rowe in your midfield, not that he doesn't work hard, but you're gonna need someone behind that's doing that ball winning. But I think I don't know who they bought him to replace him. I mean, it might just have to be someone from within because I... Smith Rowe, Sessegnon, and Cuenza from Villarreal are their only signings, and they've not brought us the defensive midfielder in. No, I believe they've been linked because Liverpool were linked with a lad from Flumen and Flumen Fluminense, Fluminense in Brazil. In, Andre. Uh, Andre, Fulham were Liverpool were linked to him because he's like a hybrid kind of six eight, like can sit, but then yeah, like, Brazilian Kobe Mane. A little bit, yeah, but a bit, I think a little bit more of a like feist. Do you know what I mean? Like a bit more of an aggressive Kobe Mainu, but a he's a meant to be. Merchant. Reminds me of Rodrigo yeah, yeah. Paul in a way. Yeah, maybe, mm. but he's meant to be really good. Obviously, clearly Liverpool. I think last summer wanted him, but he chose to stay to play in the Libertadores final or the run to the final. Yeah. And but Fulham have been massively linked to him ever since, and I believe he would be their kind of ideal replacement for Polina. It's just whether. They obviously get over the line, how much kind of the price tag would be. But they could do with a player. They need a kind of ball winner to replace because Palina does like his ball winning statistics were just crazy. His ball recoveries. That's why I started every game for Portugal in the Euros as well. Who's so yeah. confident within the team that he had around him. He could just sit there and do the dirty work. And sometimes you need that in a mid table team like Fulham. And they were fantastic yeah. last season as well. Really and good, I'm... yeah. They they were really good. And Palina will be a Huge miss if they don't replace him. Exactly. And now we have to look at someone who's going to be a huge miss for their team. So who's the second player you wanted to talk about today, James? So I'm going to talk about Amadou Anana. Because if Villa, he wasn't playing for Everton, he'd be oh, a perfect he be, number six for Liverpool. He'd be perfect. He'd be an unbel- yeah, he would have been. I think, I can't remember. I, oh, I don't know. The last, like, it's, been de- it's been ages since Liverpool and Everton have done a direct transfer. So... That was never going to happen, but yeah, oh no, like with the obviously they had their PSR struggles, so they had to sell. I think they didn't really want to sell Bramfway, um, so or and they wanted a lot of money for Bramfway, but then they got a lot of money for Amadou Anana to Villa, who obviously also had to sell a lot of players, with one being Douglas Louise, but a great, not a direct replacement to Louise, slightly different player, but a good replacement, like tall, strong, good on the ball, good tackler. I think he's just the ideal. He, he genuinely, like you said, he's an, the ideal kind of defensive midfielder for and for Villa. And also, he's got experience. Play obviously played at the Euros, for Belgium. So I don't think playing in like Champions League football. I think he's going to fit right in. Yeah. Yeah. So it's embarrassing that uh, we've seen Amadou Onana play such good football, and he's gone to Aston Villa because, for me, I think you could play in any top team in European football right now. He's that good of a player. He's got that good potential. He's going to be playing Champions League football and it's going to be challenging for top four, top five for Aston Villa. But the way, the way I find it embarrassing is because Belgium played against uh, England in one of the friendlies mm. before the Euros and yes. Onana and Mainly came head to head and everyone was just going, going there thinking he'd be a perfect supplement yeah. for Bobby Mainu. And we thought if Ineos were to go for someone, um, it would have been great to see Amadou Onana. And there were talks with Manchester United, yeah. but there was no guarantee of start time for um, really? Amadou Onana uh, we've got Casemiro it's... McTominay and you're just kind of there like come on sell it to him give him the project yeah. that he wants he would have been fantastic the next 5-10 years with Mainu next to him as well it would have been fantastic yeah. to see them both but it's very difficult when Man United can't sell McTominay can't sell Casemiro and all these other players that are on big wages and not as good as what they once were 
that is, I think, to go on Manchester United, that's their biggest. Not being able to get players out the door has been, I mean, United's issue for many, for years now because it's hard when you sign players and put them on big wages. They're just because what I think I saw, I think Harry Maguire is the third highest paid centre back in the Premier League. Now, yeah. Harry Maguire is a good, he's not a bad player. He gets a, a lot of hate, Harry Maguire. He's a good defender, but I just don't think in a, like, if Eric Ten Hag had his way, United's back line would be sat on, like, almost a halfway line, like City do, Arsenal do, Liverpool do, have that high line. You Harry Maguire can't do that, so he doesn't fit Manchester United and the way that top teams play. But he's still a good defender. Yeah. But he's also probably not the third best defender in the league, but he's the third highest paid. Why would he leave? That unfortunately, it makes no it, sense. It's crazy. It, it, it's it's unfortunate. Like it, I kind of I can see it run both ways. Like I can understand why United would want to move him on, but then if you're Harry Maguire, West Ham, who I know have been, I think were close to getting him last summer. I believe if memory serves me right. West Ham aren't paying Harry Maguire two hundred, one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand pound a week. It's just not going to be in their structure. And so, this is something where Liverpool have done it really well because of the players that you have, the quality that you've had in your team. They've never yeah. been higher than, for example, like uh, a Victor Lindelof or a Harry Maguire in terms Luis, of wages. Yeah. And it Luis goes Diaz to show that. Luis Diaz is on £50,000 a week. And for some yeah. people, that's like, oh, that's a pittance. But actually, oh, it's, oh, it's rewarding. It's a lot of money. But it's, it's a lot of money. But compared to like, like 50000 I think like Lindelof will be on like more. Do you mean for a yeah. Yeah, for, we, for a third choice centre back, fourth choice centre back is crazy. Whereas our starting left winger is on mm. fifty thousand pound a week, so that's why if play, clubs come in for Diaz, obviously we might ask for a big fee, but the wage, his wage, wouldn't be an issue. I think that's. Mm. But it's, it's very like very said, enjoyable to see that because it's like you've got so much more that you can improve, and a lot of people they just think, you know what? There's so many more people Man United need to buy. Actually, we just need to yeah. get them out the door, get them ready, mm. and just carry on because. There are talks today of Anthony leaving for oh, um, right. Saudi Arabia, and I'm like, if that happens, yeah, need it to be done. Yeah. Get rid of him, which would be good. But and then, uh, can then you can go out and because you've probably got the deals lined up, they're probably ready to go. It's just okay. We need Tommy to leave first, maybe Anthony, and then I've seen Wamba Saka as well be heavily linked out. Yeah, once they go, in come the new players. But until yeah. Because if you did, if you don't sell the others first, then you end up like Chelsea, who have yeah. you've seen their squad list. They've got like seven goalkeepers on their books, <laughs> sixteen got, different strikers, like, and you're like, what is happening here? It's crazy. That's, that's, Absolutely I think crazy. they've got like forty eight players on their books in their first, like their senior squad. And some insane. of them you've seen them for years, and you're just like, how are they still at the club? Like Gallagher's going to leave as well, but we're back to Amadou Ayana as well. Yeah, James, we have to talk about how he's going to fit into the system when you've got John McGinn, you've got someone like Bailey, uh, Ollie Watkins. Yeah. Where do you think his key strengths will come under Unai Emery in this team? I think playing in that, it's obviously slightly deeper, and because they've also got Ross Barkley back through the door, so there's a Ooh. kind of. Whereas, yeah, so is, are they going to play? Is McGinn going to get to play a bit more advanced? And then you have like Barkley, Onana. Like, I think that could be something that, because obviously Barkley is a little bit more, he's become like, he liked it at Luton last year. He was a little bit deeper, but then would push on to like kind of late runs into the box. Whereas someone like Onana can kind of like release him being a bit more defensive discipline, but then he could also carry the ball, move forward with it. So I think it opens up, like you can't be a, I don't think for like a top four, five, six kind of side now, it's kind of gone. We've moved past like the number six being the destroyer, mm. like who then just gets the ball, moves it off past short five yard pass and does that. I think the number six now, or you're holding midfielder, defensive midfielder, whatever you want to call them, it's got to do a little bit more. It's got to be cl- smart on the ball as well as winning the ball back. So I think he offers that. I think, yeah. He's going to be, I, I, Villa is going to be a fun one to watch. They were so They're fun to watch last watch. season. And you're looking at them yeah. with Ollie Watkins still staying. No one's really gone into buy yeah. him or bid for him as well, which is great. And Musa Diaby's gone to Saudi Arabia. Morgan Sanson's left as well. You've had a few people leaving, but the quality that remain is fantastic. And Emi Buendia coming back from his season-long injury as well. That was yeah. like a new signing for plan. Aston Villa as well. Um, one free signing that I've enjoyed seeing this season is Daiji Kamada coming from Lazio to Crystal Palace and Kamada was absolutely fantastic at Eintracht Frankfurt 
Then he moved to Lazio last season, and I predicted him to have a really good season in the Serie A, but he didn't. He didn't really fit into that style of play, playing out position on the bench a lot, and it didn't really work well for him. But to play under Glasner, after yeah. he's just rejuvenated Crystal Palace, we're seeing Mateta ball out at the Olympics. At least they got his dream move to Bayern Munich, and we're seeing Eze, in a way, shine as a cameo player at the European Championships for England as well. But I think Daichi Kamada will succeed at um, Crystal Palace this season I think is going to be good it's going to be fantastic for Asian football for Japanese football yeah. and the fact that he will be playing with Eze in this 3-4-3 system is going to be very very enjoyable to see more of what he's done and especially linking up with his old manager Glasner that he works with at Frankfurt and won the Europa League with together yeah. what's your thoughts? Yeah I think Oliver Glasner's shown how he can improve players I think that is that's when coaches who can not just obviously bringing in your the players that suit your system is good, and obviously bringing in a player he's previously worked with that does often help. But then also the way he improved. I mean, Crystal Palace at the back end of last season, they weren't sm- that was cra- that was crazy. Like criminal losing to them four 0 I thought we'd have lost by eight because they were that good. I went yeah because they that I think Glasner's first win in the league was at Anfield, and I was unfortunately there. For that, because I went, it was, I was like, okay, Palace, new manager. They, I was like, they looked better, but they hadn't got the results. New manager, and they came there. Effect. Well, it came into effect a little bit late. I was like, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, but they were just unbelievable. Like Adam Wharton in midfield, I was, it was, it was great. Like the way he's improved, and I was like, you said, moving to get an Elise, his dream move to Bayern Munich, the way he was playing at the end of last season. So I think Kamada is going to slot in, and they're just going to, I think. Palace, I think with Palace, it's difficult to know what's like, what is a good season? Um, Do you know, because Palace, like, like, well, that's the thing with Palace. I like the, oh, well, they just finished between 10th and 12th every year. They're happy like, with it. But for this season, with them not being even, in European football, that's got to be their aim with the quality that they've got with Glasgow. Try and, and break, top half. break top half and cup run. Cups have got, like, cups need to, like, clubs, like, when you, if you're like 9th to like 13th, like there isn't that because everyone's so worried about going down or whatever. Tr- make a like early season. Go for like the Carabao because if you're Palace, you've got to play like four, win four games in the Carabao, and you're into like the quarters, semi final or something. I think because I don't think Palace have ever won like a major. I don't think they've. I think they're all those like. Because Alan Pardew had to. Alan Pardew had to jinx it with that stupid dance <laughs> like, like Wembley. That, yeah, it's just, it? uh, like yeah. It's like, like, that, come on, it? what are you doing? Oh, Jason Punch has got an absolute screamer. And they, they're like... The bench, I'm just like, come on, that's not going to happen. And then, what, Fellaini? No, is it Mata and Lingard that scored, which was crazy. Fellaini with the chest down. I was like, that was a crazy cup final. But Palace should have won that because we were down to 10 men as well. Uh, Chris Mullin sent off, which was insane. Yeah. But no, I reckon I reckon Glass is going to give I them think... ambition that they need. And I reckon with yeah. Kamada, it's going to be fantastic because it's a bit of a, a bit of a showman about him as well. And we've seen a lot less Mavericks in football now. And Kamada definitely has been that yeah. uh, for Japan and for Frankfurt. Not so much at Lazio, but he has done in the past, yeah. which will be great. Think, yeah, like you said, he went to Lazio, hasn't quite worked out. So getting a move, it's no, if it's, it's always a difficult one when players, obviously when they move club and then after one season are already moving on again. Because you worry like, like, but obviously he's linking up back with the manager that he plays best football under. Yeah. So I think it's probably a smart, a smart move. And Crystal Palace are an exciting kind of proposition. If I have the minute, Nick. It definitely will be because I'm looking at it and I know you want to speak about Mark Gurhi as well. He's arrived back at Crystal Palace for pre-season yeah. training coming up for the new season, but he is linked with Newcastle. And on this podcast, we don't really talk about rumours as such, but I thought, you know what? I'll make an exception. It's your debut, James. So let's talk about what happens if Gurhi does leave Crystal Palace. Does that leave a big hole for them? The sell-on fee for Chelsea? Let's hear your thoughts. It's in, I think it's kind of one of those weird ones where from at least my, I, what I've seen and kind of like from Palace fans who they don't seem to, like, not that they would be, like, want him to go, but they seem like, I think they were playing, at the end of our season, he wasn't playing for them much. Mm. He wasn't playing as much as, as football as he, like, you'd think. So I think if any, if it does go through, I think it's a good move for everyone. And Bob, especially if they're, what, 65 kind of million fee, good fee for Palace, great player for Newcastle. If anything, it sounds kind of harsh, like, I, I rate Newcastle, good club and stuff, but if anything, for Gay. It might he might be the one that like I he could be put he could go to a club in your like in the Champions League. Yeah, I think he could easily like 
obviously I know you guys just bought like Lenny Euro, but like Manchester United, him and Lissandra Martinez work would work as a kind of ask like that he could play he could play for all the clubs pushing Europe. I think Liverpool Liverpool were one of the ones linked to him, but I think too many I don't think we could offer him that guaranteed starting time. Absolutely. So, but new but Newcastle, him alongside like Fabian Shaw. Or Sven Botman. That's a Him strong... Him replacing Shah, because Shah's like 33, 34 as well. And True. with them going into European football, that would be a big thing, a big ambition for them going forward into European football. Yeah, because that's what they... I imagine... Because obviously they missed out on European football last year because of United winning the FA Cup. Mm. So, so I think what Eddie Howe's definitely gone to him, like we had an off year last year, but I think they'd be one to look out for for that kind of top seven, six, try to get in the end of... get some European football barring any injury crisis like that last year. And I think getting in what arguably England's best player at the Euros, Mark Gahey. Maybe, like, maybe. Argue, like, it wasn't exactly a low, like a long list to choose from. Maybe the most consistent, you could probably argue. I think yeah, consistent. Fantastic. So I think he offers good on the ball. But I think as a top kind of Europe, as a top centre half, you've got to be good on the ball. Exactly. And, and it's you've got to be able to well. carry it out of the fence. Yeah. He offers everything as a top centre half. So great move by Newcastle if they get it over the line. If it happens, which would be good. Because with me, the, the one to play for my team, I can't really talk about Euro because he's injured until November, which ain't annoying. But yeah. Joshua Zerxi has come into Manchester yeah. United wearing the number 11 shirt. So he's following along the lines of some good players and not so good players yeah. as well. But um, yeah, with Joshua Zerxi, he's describing himself as a false nine, as a nine and a half. So yeah. there's maybe a new change of play for how we're going to go about the season where it's not going to be breaking through the lines as much but playing within um the defenses which would be very difficult and it may suit Eric Ten Hag's way of playing but a realistic thing from my point of view looking at it is how badly do we need to change to get all these shots that we've conceded to lower down from 20 a game to 15 to 5 because Maybe it is the fact that we need to press better from the front. And Hoyland could do that last season. Anthony could do that from last season. Garnacho could do that. But there's always that constant battle of we've not really replaced anyone in that midfield where our constant issues were last season as well. Let me hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, first, I actually have a throwback question to you. Do you think Zerpski and her Hoyland, are they going to play together? If nah. like, is it'll it not one so or the it... other. Right, Okay. So it'll be, it'll be one of those where Hoyland definitely starts as a number nine if they're both fit and Zerxi will be on the yeah. bench. There'll be times when we'll play against someone like Man City or Liverpool and we may have to start Xerxes as that false nine so he can press a bit more yeah. as well, work within the wingers who will be attacking Garnacho Rashford with their pace. Um, but with the way I'm seeing it as well, I don't see them both starting together unless we're playing two strikers yeah. up front. No, that's fair enough because that was obviously like the FA Cup final and the back in the last season when United were kind of functioning well they would use that like kind of like triple two like press with almost like two midfield like it was kind of weird but without a striker so that the pressing was more in sync yeah. I think yeah I mean I think Manchester United, if Manchester United go into the season with Casemiro as in that pit kind of pivot with like Maynou and Fernandez. God knows where Mason Mount's going to play, but mm. that's a. I think that that would worry me. Like in in unless like I just think you need to like, and I feel for Mania a little bit because he'd just end up getting left out to dry a touch. Unless it's a bit, it's a bit worrying because it's like unless Mason Mount's one of the two, because in preseason we've seen Sancho play as one of those false nines as well, who's not actually a striker. So it's been like you got. Sancho and then you had like Mount and you're just like oh okay this is how they're going to go about it but we know when Fernandez comes back into the team he'll replace Mason Mount yeah. straight away and you're not going to put Mount on the wing because it never really works is no, the craziest it, thing is yeah I just I I like that's the thing with you know I think the cast like it like last season like you said it was the the shot the 20 shots United as I think Jamie Carragher pointed this out across the season where United's back line were deep but then the press sometimes would be kind of like high to medium. Yeah. And it was like, and there was just this, it was trying to do two things at once that you can't do. And especially because of the lack of mobility that Casemiro has. So you've almost got to either bring one in or bring like, there's got to be that kind of middle ground. You can't do, you've got to have it more compact, even if you are. Like Man City is still compact. They're mm-hmm. just defences higher up. So I'm, 
unless I mean obviously if you're with it's a shame with Lemmy Euro if he was fit I imagine that him and Lissandra Martinez that back line would be higher so then maybe you'd be able to kind of like hide some of Casemiro's like issues now with his like mobility issues and Maynou could cover for that a little bit but it's the fact that even with McTominay still in the squad as well and there's not yeah. accepting bid for Fulham for £20 million, pounds, you're just kind of looking at it thinking if we do need to replace someone like with the Ogarte, with Zubin Mendy, with Fofana who've been linked with recently as well, we can't get them in because we've just got all these midfielders that we have to get rid of. And it's been very, very difficult to really see yeah. how Van Hal, not Van Hal, how Ten Hag wants to really improve it because it's very, very upsetting to see that he's not getting rid of these players and you can't get rid of them enough because like we said earlier in the conversation their wages are still very very high and no one really wants to pay for them which is understandable yeah. at the end of the day and you, you, like I Scott McTominay is like an a, a, such a, a like a enigma of a player because mm. we're not an enigma but he's brilliant he offers he is useful but he's not like I don't really but he's like kind of useful in like the last 15 minutes of a game where you're chasing it maybe yeah like if you could put him, if you were going gung ho and just going to like need a goal, he's someone you throw on. But then he, he doesn't really like, he doesn't want to be that. He doesn't work really like you can't play him next to Manu because he can't, doesn't really show for the ball and take it on like the half turn to players like that kind of double pivot. He has like 17 touches him. per game, like one or two of them will be attacks on goal, which will be shots or, or headers as well, which so is crazy to think about for a midfielder. It's, yeah, it's one of those where you look at it and go, you don't. He, he is he's effective in kind of what he does, but I don't think if Man United if if Eric Ten Hag's yeah if he's got ambitions to build a side that could win the Premier League, yeah. Unless I think Big Tommy's probably on too high a wage and wants to play too much football for him to really be a part of the squad. But then you kind of, then you need to cash in. But if United want more than twenty million for him, I don't know where. I think it's just got we just got to cut our losses in that way as well. Keep McTominay. Yeah out of the squad but it's one of those things that we, we're we going to do that last season with David Moyes and West Ham and he scores two last mm-hmm. minute goals against Brentford at Old Trafford and everyone loves him again and you're like oh he's close to being our top scorer which is crazy to yeah. think about because everyone else wasn't really performing and they were down in tools as well which was worrying Um, but yeah one last well we've done we've done three each as well which is pretty good but before we wrap up James I just want to ask you who's your best signing of the summer so far and why my oh, best Outside prem, prem, just Premier League or just Premier League? Okay, because I mean, probably outside Premier League, you probably can't uh, un- ignore Kylian Mbappe. But um, you keep quiet on Kylian because Kylian's got that hundred and fifty million pound sign on fee, and you're like, "Geez, that's a lot." That's he a was lot. free. He was free. He cost them nothing. He like he this, cost them this nothing. Mug, this mug was more expensive than Kylian Mbappe when you think about it. Yeah, apparently, and he's he's not on a hundred. I don't know, a five hundred grand a week or whatever. <laughs> Definitely not. We don't have to worry about that at all. It's insane. You have to build uh, a new stadium to sell it to fund Mbappe's wages. It's insane. The shirts will pay crazy. for itself in a way, but yeah, yeah from I'm, the oh, Premier League. Who... I, yeah, from the Premier League. I think I'll, I'll, I'll go back to from the German, from the guys I've mentioned. I think just because I think it was a weak spot in their defense. I think Calafiori as that left back mm. coming into if he can if they can use him as that kind of like. Zinchenko would do invert into alongside Declan Rice or Georgi or whoever's playing in that sixth role. I think if they could, there's Arsenal in that point where they are like the finest of margins away. Correct them and they will win the league. Yeah. I know City is still a behemoth and City could go and get 98 points and there's not a lot you can do with that. But I think Arsenal are. Yeah. Yeah. I think Arsenal are little side, like, and just squad signings. And because like last season when Kivio is not a bad player, but I don't think he's like quite at the minute, at least as good as what they want at that left left back, inverted left back mm. type thing. So I think, and with like Timber as well, who basically didn't play all, didn't play at all last year, I think, or kicked for end. So I think Calafiori coming to Arsenal. I mean, he might not even, he might not even be noticeable as like a, he made a difference. But That's something that you be, want. That's something you want as a exactly. defender. You want, like, people weren't, like, when City signed a Kanji from Dortmund for, like, 15 million, no one was really, like, high on, like, no one was going, car. that's going to be the signing that keeps City in the league, but he's an effective player. Yeah. Sometimes that's all you need. You don't need the kind of extravagant 
big signing. You need an effective signing that will just small margins. Maybe he he can turn Villa at home isn't a two 0 loss. He could like he had to like late in the game stub him on bring him. There's just it just gives you an extra option, and I think he's an improvement on their starting eleven if he comes in at that left back role. Definitely, for me, is someone that I have to kind of hype up because I've not really seen much of him, but I'm very excited from what I've been told about watching this guy play. So there's one of the promoted players that have come in from Leicester City. Oh, yeah. it's, got, it's got a new manager. So Abdul Fatua from Sporting Lisbon, who was on loan last season to Leicester City, was a big reason as to why they play such expansive football under Maresca and why it was so enjoyable um, that Leicester City got promoted straight away back again in the Premier League. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he brings, the pace, the directness from his play, and hopefully we'll see something more positive from a promoted side as opposed to always trying to struggle and not really give it their all because it's already worrying to see but that's another topic for another day which is yeah next time next time indeed but no everyone thanks so much go on I was going to say James thank you very much for this conversation it's been fantastic great day of you more along the season I'm sure of it it'll be great fun Um, but no everyone thank you very much for listening take care James your outro what have you got to say to the audience Uh, not a lot not (laughs) a lot other than Arnie Slot's red gonna gonna win the league so can't wait (laughs) I just need to we, see who uh, this mystery number six will be. Adam Morton for yeah. 70 million out of nowhere. So, mystery number six. If it ends up being Sander Burge, then... <laughs> Adam Morton. Yeah, like, out of nowhere. Right, yeah, no, make it... Marquee signing. Richard Hughes, give us a mar- give us a marquee six that gives us the feeling of slots reds are going to win the league. It's going to come out of nowhere and we won't expect it at all, which would be crazy. But uh, everyone, thank you very much for listening. Take care and we'll see you later. Goodbye. Thanks for having me, Hamza.